When it comes to being a better JavaScript developer, broadly speaking, of course, the best thing you can do is use the language more and become more proficient at it. But even if you're already proficient with JavaScript, there's a bunch of things I like to call low-hanging fruit that a lot of people seem to overlook sometimes and that will make you a better JavaScript developer. So in this video, I wanted to share those things with you. So let's get started. Although it might seem obvious, one of the most impactful things JavaScript developers can do is to stay up to date with the latest version of Node.js, or if you're working on the front end, stay up to date with the latest version of Babel.js, which is the source-to-source -source transpiler. Node.js is evolving at a pretty fast pace, but it's not evolving at a reckless pace, meaning that if you upgrade to the latest versions, it's not like it's breaking all of your software. They do deprecate things from time to time, but this will not happen abruptly. You'll start seeing warnings in your console, and you know you need to change something to the non-deprecated version. The most important thing to look for here is to stay on an even number release because those are going to be the long-term support releases. The odd number releases are the latest and greatest current version. The long-term support versions are maintained for around 30 months, so you'll be good there. Keep in mind that Node.js is only 11 years old, and prior to Node.js's release, JavaScript was kind of not so modern. So they're kind of playing catch up, making sure all the features are in there, and it's evolving every time a new version comes out. So it makes sense to stay up to date with the latest version of Node.js when you can. Next thing you can do is make use of well-supported NPM modules. Now the keyword in this sentence is well-supported. If it's not well-supported, then it's kind of a pitfall. You're gonna end up depending on a package that maybe like two people download per week, it hasn't been updated in five years, but it's the only thing on NPM that you're looking for, so you use it anyways. And this may cause problems down the road, so for those sorts of situations, you might wanna consider just writing it yourself. However, for well-supported NPM modules, there's really no reason to reinvent the wheel on certain things. Like for instance, Node.js has a WebSocket library called WS. This particular library has been downloaded 60 million times this week, and it was last updated 13 days ago. And those are the two main things that I look at. How often is it being downloaded, and when was it updated? Using well-supported NPM modules saves you a ton of time and makes your code better, because they've been working on this same tool for however many years, and whatever you are going to produce in maybe a month or two is probably not going to be as good as what they produced. So for a tool like this, it's been downloaded 60 million times in a week, and they're still maintaining it. I would be confident using this in pretty much any project, regardless of how important it was. Now, in terms of which NPM modules to avoid, here's a perfect example of this. This is a project that is version 0.0.1, .0 telling me that it was only released one time. It was last updated seven years ago, and it was downloaded a couple, uh, a few hundred times this week. Most of those are probably bots doing mirrors, so the number of actual people downloading it is probably pretty small. This would be a pretty risky module to depend on since it's not being worked on. It's most likely the API has changed in the last seven years, so it might not even work at all. It's not going to get any future updates, and this is a perfect candidate for something you might want to just write yourself. The guy who authored this package most likely built it for himself and then said, you know what, I'll go ahead and post it to NPM as well. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Good on him for wanting to contribute to the community and NPM and the packages on there, but this is not a package that I personally would want to depend on. This next one is mostly just for people who work on front-end things, and it's to use a bundler when you are making front-end JavaScript projects. And if you're not sure what a bundler is, it's a tool that'll allow you to take a project that looks a lot like a Node.js project and run it in the browser. If you don't use a bundler, then more or less you're just going to include a number of JavaScript files using the script tag, and then you're just going to write code that interacts with those files. A bundler also allows you to install things via NPM, and this is very powerful. The most popular and common bundler by far is going to be Webpack, but there's other options such as like Parcel, and I think I've made a video on Webpack, and I'll include a link to that in the description. Using a bundler also means things like babel.js will be tightly integrated in your project, and that way you can write the most modern JavaScript available for the browser, even if the browser doesn't support it, because babel.js will turn extremely modern JavaScript into kind of old JavaScript that is guaranteed to be ran in any browser. The next very important and also very easy thing to do to up your JavaScript game is to use async and await, and only use normal promises to defer execution of code. Now when I say normal promises, I'm referring to promise style callbacks. You're of course going to use promises no matter what, you're just going to use those promises with async and await. Working with async things in JavaScript has evolved a total of twice since the release. This was the very first way it looked like with the very first version of Node.js. This is called Node.js style callbacks, which is essentially a function with the arguments as the first, second, third 
argument in the function. And then the very last argument is going to be a callback to run at the end of this function. The obvious problem with this is if function two depended on function one, then you'd have to nest function two in function one. And furthermore, if function three depended on function two, you'd have to nest that again. With the introduction of promises to Node.js, the whole callback problem mostly went away, but it still wasn't really clean. With promise style callbacks, rather than having to nest functions inside other functions, you can use a thing called dot then, which says, once this promise is fulfilled, then respond with this data. From there, you can return another promise and you can chain them like that. So no matter how many ASIC functions you chain here, it does not nest farther and farther out to the right. It's just, it's more linear. This also allowed for handling errors in one central location. And the final and current evolution to handling async things in Node.js is the async and await style. Probably the thing you notice is we've done away with the callback entirely. And instead of using a callback, we use the await keyword. And the await keyword has a very special property, and that's it will block the code right there until it's done executing. This brings it in line with a bunch of other languages which, which already have await, and this function is exactly the same as those other languages. So now we've done entirely away with the nesting, entirely away with the with the weird syntax, and we have something that both looks and works great. So if you're not already using this method in both Node.js and in front-end stuff, transpile with Babel, I, I highly recommend that this is the only way that you do things going forward. Now, remember earlier I said you should still use promises for things that you want to defer. And by defer, I mean you want to run it at some point, but maybe not right now. For this, you can write something like this, call function for without the await keyword. That way it'll run asynchronously at some point. And then using the traditional dot then, you can specify a callback for something you might want to run later. The next one, and this is pretty simple, is to use strict equality, which is the triple equal sign exclusively as opposed to unstrict. If you've ever been in programmer humor or seen a JavaScript meme, then you already know that JavaScript has some quirks and some weirdness when it comes to comparing different things. Now, I, I say quirks and weirdness, but it's all well-defined by the ECMAScript standard. It's just sometimes it behaves in a way that people say is not intuitive. For instance, I can take a one, I can compare it to the string version of a one, and it tells me that those two things are the same. Now, it's really quite simple why this is. It's because when JavaScript compares two things that are not of the same type, what it does is it converts both sides to a string and then does a string comparison. So in other words, when the integer one is compared to the string one, what's really happening is it's wrapping one in parentheses and calling two string on it, which turns it into a string one. So you can see now, if I do that same thing with triple equal sign and I compare it to string one, you can see that that is indeed the same. Now, because double equal sign only compares value, which requires JavaScript to convert both sides to strings, triple equal sign compares value and type. So if I do the same as the first one, if I try to compare with strict equality a integer one to a string one, you can see that that's going to be false. That's because if I do type of one, you can see it's a number. If I do type of one, you can see that's a string. So although they are the same value, according to JavaScript, they're not the same type and therefore they're not equal. There's really no good reason that I can think of to use non-strict equality. So you should just internalize that you want to use triple equal signs all the time. Next tip is to not block the event loop. And this one is generally only a problem when people don't fully understand the event loop and how it relates to JavaScript. JavaScript, as many of you know, runs single threaded and uses an event loop to attain its asynchronicity. This is a very powerful feature of JavaScript that lets it do a lot of async things concurrently. However, one of the main things you can do to break the event loop is to run something that is very CPU intensive for a long period of time. Because it's single threaded, if you're doing some CPU intensive work on the only thread available, it's going to make all other async operations grind to a halt until that CPU intensive task has been taken care of. For CPU intensive tasks, the best way to handle that with modern JavaScript is by using worker threads. This is JavaScript code that can be executed outside the context of your current JavaScript program using an independent thread. And last but not least, try to avoid clever one-liners, meaning code that you're stuffing onto one line when maybe three to five lines would be better. So consider the following two pieces of code. This would be the normal way to do it. It takes a variable called a in, and if it's a one, it outputs the word one. If it's a two, it outputs the word two. Otherwise, it outputs the word none. This is very clear and obvious, even looking at it, what it does. You can add a three if you wanted, you can extend it however you want, and everything's fine. 
Now, some people might take these 10 lines of code and try to compress it into a single line that looks like this. Now, although this is the exact same thing as above and you've saved nine lines of code, this is definitely not better. It's harder to read, it's less obvious when you look at it, and it's not as easily extended as this one would be. Always try to prefer readability of your code above anything else. And that's it for the video. These are some really quick and easy things you can do to be a better JavaScript developer. I hope you found this video helpful. If you have any questions or comments about anything you saw in the video, please leave them below in the comments. Other than that, have a great rest of your day and take care.